What's up, what's up everybody? Welcome to Sum Zero again. Um, today we're, we're going to talk about Ethereum 2.0, which um, has been in the headlines a lot recently due to recent um, protocol upgrades. I'm sure everyone listening on this call is familiar with um, EIP 1559. Um, so Nick Hill uh, uh who's our guest today, he, he posted a piece almost, I'd actually go so far as to call it a manifesto, an 80 page um, research paper on Ethereum, uh, you know, on some zero back in May. Um, and there's been a lot of, you know, I think conversation within the some zero community about, about Ethereum over the last couple of years, I actually personally had posted um, a piece on Ethereum back in 2018 when it was, I think at the time trading closer to a thousand, a thousand dollars a coin. Um, since then, it's obviously had some pretty serious ups and downs. Uh, most recently, I recall, uh, during crypto winter at one point it uh, dipped below a hundred dollars a coin. Um, but I think over this period of time, so much has changed. Uh, Nick Hill, you're, um, you're becoming an authority on this, uh, you know, based upon a lot of your work. Um, so, you know, just, just to start, maybe uh, just give everyone, everyone um, just a, a little bit on how you discovered Ethereum, kind of what, what the initial, um, you know, just, just what, what piqued your interest about it initially vis-a-vis -vis Bitcoin? Um, and then we can get into some of the new stuff uh, that's going on with ETH2O, Proof of Stake, 15, you know, 1559, um, and, and other stuff that's, that's happening in, in, in the crypto world. Yeah, um, I initially got into this whole space with uh, the Bitcoin halving, which, you know, people talk about the Bitcoin halving as like, having this huge feature, the volatility brings people into the community. Uh, and that's so true, right? Like that's uh, absolutely how I got into it. And I have to say, that's probably, I'm not the first one who got in through a um, having event. Um, so I started learning about Bitcoin. When you start learning about Bitcoin, you learn a lot about monetary policy. Um, and I found that really interesting. Um, but ultimately, I mean, I think what Bitcoin investors see as a big strength is that Bitcoin is fairly simple to understand. Uh, fixed supply, uh, you know, very easy monetary policy. I think there's some technical things that people don't understand about how blockchains work that you have to sort out when you're first getting into it. Um, but once you answer your questions about how blockchains work and how scarcity works, uh, fairly simple to understand. Um, and so then I, since then, you know, I've been learning more about kind of other cryptocurrencies and I've pretty much fi primarily focused on Ethereum just because I think in that sense, Ethereum is the total opposite. It's constantly in flux. There's an incredibly high level of uncertainty uh, in, in a good and a bad way. Um, but ultimately people are building new things on it and it's a lot more difficult to understand for that reason. Um, so I found it really interesting that, you know, historically Ethereum's price has moved pretty much in lockstep with Bitcoin. But when you start digging into it, it's very different. Um, and I started to realize, you know, there's a lot of, small commentary on, on different updates and things happening in the space, but no one was really putting it all together for uh, kind of what Ethereum is about and, and how to think about it as an investor, which was, I think, really the angle I wanted to take. Yeah, and I would just add um, to your point about Bitcoin being simple to understand. Um, it's funny you say that because, <laughs> you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll find myself in conversations with folks who are just baffled by it. Um, <laughs> I, I would say, though, for the people who understand or have at least um, cursory understanding of the, the technology behind Bitcoin, the much harder thing to understand is the valuation, not so much like what it actually does. Um, and so uh, and, and the same is obviously uh, true with Ethereum. But I, I think, um, you know, a lot of your work kind of addresses that <laughs> it's sort of the, you know, OK, there's this cool tech you know, how do we frame it in terms of its, its actual long-term value? Um, well, exactly. I mean, I think the, the Bitcoin, when, when the Bitcoin community kind of talks about digital gold, like that's useful because it really is like what they're trying to build, you know? Um, Ethereum, it's like, everyone's like, what is Ethereum? And it's like, it's tough because I feel like any analogy that I use kind of pigeonholes Ethereum and it's like, okay, yeah, it, you could kind of view it like this, but it's really more than that because of these other things. And then it quickly devolves from a simple meme into like this really hard to understand mess. Um, 
So yeah, Ethereum has a communications problem, but I think that's, it's a good thing because it means that there's so much there. Yeah, on, on that note, would you, I mean, do you generally agree with the analogy, you know, if you kind of think of Bitcoin as this like digital rock, you know, you would agree that Ethereum is this digital online global, you know, decentralized computer. Is that, is that kind of like maybe the, the simplest way to put it? What, how, how do you frame it for folks who are new to it? Yeah, I, I think if Bitcoin is digital gold, I, I think the, the analogy that was used is, um, is that Ethereum is, is digital oil uh, or, you know, digital gas. And the reason is, um, the, key, the key there is, I think, think of Ethereum as like a commodity. Uh, you can use it to, to use products and services. And the products and services are the, the Ethereum network, the Ethereum blockchain, right? So it's, it's, that, it's that simple, but then it, the complicated part goes, okay, this Ethereum network, like what can it do? You know, why is being able to use it worth anything? Um, and that I think is, you know, a discussion you can go down and there's a lot of different ways to approach that question. But that's the key thing is that Ethereum is primarily like you buy Ether to use it. Um, and you buy it because you can't use certain services. You can't do certain things without it in the same way that you can't drive your car without gasoline. Uh, and so it's going to be like, you know, gasoline's worth more when, you know, driving is more important to us and it's worth right. less uh, when driving is less important to us. And, and of course there's also supply and demand dynamics and ether is the same way. It's like when using the Ethereum network is more valuable, uh, ether will be more valuable. Uh, and that's going to be uh, kind of a, a growth that occurs in the context of these supply and demand dynamics. So if, just like with oil, like if, if there's more of it, then even if driving is more important to you, it, the price will go down in the same way with, with ether, it's just a commodity that way. And that's how I think. Yeah. About it. So let's, let's maybe table the discussion on like the potential use cases for the Ethereum blockchain. Um, we can, we can certainly have, you know, that discussion later, but I, I want to uh, zero in on the, uh, the supply demand dynamics, because I think that's why a lot of people are, you know, on this call and, and are going to want to watch this and, and hear what you have to say about it. Um, can you just frame, you know, just, and I, just to give folks some backdrop, um, if, if, you know, if you listen to videos on Ethereum, even the, the bulls oftentimes talk about Ethereum in the context of you know, they'll make a conclusory statement about price target. And it's usually somewhere between like 10 and $20,000 per ether token. Yeah. Um, you know, Nikhil comes out and he's like, wait a second, guys, this is $150,000 a token um, in a call it, you know, two year time frame, or you gave some time frame that was like yeah. relatively short term. Um, and I, I think a lot of people were sort of like, whoa, like, is that possible? You know, because that I think that implied a market cap that was, yeah, you know, very high, very high. Uh, you, you know, we're talking multiple trillions. And so um, part of the reasoning behind this, you know, uh, this target that you came up with, which was, you know, well above, I think, what many people had had thrown out there, um, you, you know, at least on the Internet, uh, was the transition to proof of stake, uh, part one of which is, you um, EIP 1559 and, and, and this, you know, kind of phase one London hard fork thing. So can you just explain to, uh, you know, folks where you just, what, what are the sort of high level um, uh, ideas, you know, and a catalyst that are going to drive the price up vis-a-vis -vis the fundamental changes that are going on um, in the network itself? Yeah. So I think, I think the first thing, uh, I want to do this in a little bit of a different way than I've done it in the past, just because I think we have a different audience and I think it'd be useful for the audience to think in terms of the market structure. So um, I think the most important thing to understanding this prediction is before you look at Ethereum, you have to understand Bitcoin's price action and you can see the chart, right? But, but underneath the price, there's a lot of kind of underlying dynamics that, that guide that structure. Um, so I think the, the way you should think about it is um, big picture, Bitcoin has you know, famously a fixed supply of 21 million, right? Um, but in practice, the circulating supply is, is not fixed. Uh, 
Bitcoin is being mined and the circulating supply is kind of increasing, um, the rate of that increase slows over time so that the supply ends up at 21 million. But right now, every day, there are more Bitcoin on the market. Okay. Um, so when Bitcoin's price is going up, it's in that context. It's in the context of like circulating supply dilution, right? Um, and that's really important to recognize um, because when people think about like, why does the halving event uh, matter? It's decreasing the rate of that dilution. I talk about kind of miner sell pressure, the idea that the miners are getting new supply and they're dumping it on the market. And if they're dumping less of it on the market, um, that changes price. And the reason is because when you look at Bitcoin, you just see the price, you're not realizing like there's, and I'll pick a number here, but let's say there's like a hundred thousand new Bitcoin today, right? And there are buyers for that. And if there weren't buyers for that, the price would be going down. So if the price is going up, there are new buyers coming on to just to take that new supply uh, every time it comes to market. Um, if that supply goes away because a Bitcoin halving event happens and the amount of new supply goes down by 50%, those buyers, they come to market, they put the buy orders in and those buyers are now filled by, by different Bitcoin, right? And, and therefore it has to be Bitcoin at a higher price. So that's the kind of mechanics of my, my having a thesis is that when you have this, this asset that is, uh, has a price that's stable or rising in the face of like pretty severe uh, inflation of circulating supply, uh, that means when you decrease the, the rate of new issuance, there's a kind of a net buying pressure and, uh, and that's gonna force price upwards. Um, the second thing though, that I think people really underestimate is the amount of, uh, it's called hodling, but the amount of basically just buying and holding uh, for long periods with the intention to never sell at any price <laughs> um, that goes on in this space. Um, and so I guess an example that I use is if, if uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make up some numbers for prices just to make it more intuitive for the audience. But if, if Bitcoin was at $10 and let's say the circulating supply was, was uh, 10 Bitcoin, right? So this entire asset would be a uh, hundred dollars, right? And and during the bear market, nine of the Bitcoin, or ninety dollars, get bought up, right? Now there's just there's there's like a tenth of the supply is left, uh, and it's at ten dollars. And then the halving event happens, and as I just described, that forces the price to go up, right? So let's say it goes up by ten times. Um, so now Bitcoin is at a hundred dollars. The market cap is ten uh, x what it was, but the amount in circulation is just that one Bitcoin, right? So now one Bitcoin is a hundred dollars. Um, and so if you're following me, the circulating supply before the halving event was 10 Bitcoin at $10, 100 US dollars circulating supply. $90 got accumulated and a halving event increased the price. So after the fact, the circulating supply is one Bitcoin at $100. In other words, the circulating supply before and after is actually the same as it was. And in a future cycle, in order to cause this kind of price to continue increasing, you don't need like a huge new larger influx of investors. You just need 90 more dollars to decrease the circulating supply by 90% again. And, and this is the key, you need the investors who bought Bitcoin in the first place to, to keep their supply out of circulation. And that's where Bitcoin really differs from other stocks because you're probably thinking, okay, that's a great Ponzi scheme argument, but why doesn't every stock work like this? And, and the reason is just that and other assets, people are not just, just holding on to it after the price increases 10 times. And if they were, you'd get these really weird distortions. Uh, and that's crucial to understand because when I talk about a 150K price target for Ethereum and a $16 trillion market cap, uh, the reason people express skepticism is because they rightly think, where is $16 trillion coming from? Like, who, is, who has $16 trillion to buy Ethereum with? Uh, and the answer is no one does. And, and if it took that to move the price that high, um, it wouldn't go that high, right? You, you can't, that's, that's like a third of the market cap of equities. Like that's not the inflows. Um, but to really understand the price moves that we're seeing in the crypto space, you have to understand that market structure requires a much smaller amount of inflows in order to move the price by a much larger amount. Um, and I'll pause there to just clarify, did that kind of make sense? Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, the, the question is, uh, you know, as it relates to Bitcoin or Ethereum is, um, 
Yeah, we'll like, bring it like, to Ethereum. <laughs> right. Like what is the, uh, I don't know, the, the fraction of the, um, like the wallets that do hodl as opposed to, um, you know, just, I mean, obviously the, the, the crypto world is known much more for, for day trading than it is um, hodling. Um, now, a lot of this um, is changing with um, institutions coming in, into the into the picture. Um, you know, th there are uh, arguably more hodlers or kind of longer term investors out there that that have kind of more of an institutional time frame associated with their investing. They're not just trading on a you know on a daily or monthly or weekly basis, but have you know multi year time horizons. Um, but what, what would you say, and I think this is one of the more interesting elements of your research, um, are, are the hodling dynamics with Ethereum versus Bitcoin? I mean, we, we read headlines, but like what's actually going on there in terms of who's hodling, who's not? Um, and by the way, we can, we can also use the word hold. You know, the <laughs> sure. Yeah, we'll just uh, keep it simple. But yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so, so first of all, when you look at Ethereum in the last in the last cycle falling from what, well, yeah, you said it was like 1,400 to under a hundred. Um, I think it's been pretty well documented by a lot of people that the reason is because people weren't, weren't just holding their Ethereum. They were actually just liquidating it. Whereas Bitcoin did not have that dynamic. Um, and at the time there's a very concrete reason for that, which is that in the last cycle, we were seeing the ICO, the initial coin offering boom, and everyone was getting paid, like they were literally just paying their employees with these new tokens that they were offering. And, uh, you know, there was, there's no funding in the space. So all the funding was from, was from these assets. And so as the bubble kind of peaked, people were cashing out. And so there was the opposite of, of, of holding on for, you know, for dear life. It's like they were literally liquidating everything. And so there was very little um, of that dynamic. And I think you actually saw... Uh, Ethereum draw down what 90 plus percent, just like any other altcoin during that cycle. And Bitcoin did not, right? Bitcoin drew down quite a bit. Um, but I mean, I think it compared to Ethereum, it, it held its value incredibly well. Um, and I think it's because, you know, the liquidation in Bitcoin came from this smaller fraction, uh, which does dictate the circulating supply. Um, but it was kind of cleaned out pretty quickly. And then you got this period of accumulation. Wouldn't you agree that part of the reason the, the Ethereum drop was as bad as it was, was because it had sort of failed on its mission of being this, you know, layer one framework for decentralized applications. Like you bring up the ICO craze, that was effectively the first killer app in a sense for sure. Ethereum and it failed um, miserably. Some of that was regulatory, but mm -hmm. uh, I get the sense that people may have been starting to question whether anyone would build stuff on Ethereum uh, back during that time frame. You know, whereas now you have DeFi, you have NFTs, you have like other stuff going on where people are willing to buy into like the, the longer term vision of, of Ethereum. Whereas with Bitcoin, because, you know, Bitcoin is sort of the application in and of itself. Um, it's not like the thesis behind it really changed even during crypto winter as much as it did with Ethereum because there's nothing built on top of Bitcoin. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the I think the big difference is that you you buy you buy Bitcoin to have you know digital gold. You're buying an asset class. Um, you buy Ethereum. You know the the value prop is you you buy it to use it, um, or you buy it as an investment asset because other people will be using it, right? But the key is, are people going to use it for something? And if you go back to to that period of time, like none of the DeFi apps that we're talking about exist. So there's right. really nothing to use it for, you know, uh, and then the only thing to use it for at the time was to raise money. And so people raised it by selling it for U.S. dollars. Uh, and so we saw this huge price decline. Um, but kind of getting back to what you were saying, like that the environment today is, has changed dramatically. And, and this is why I get frustrated with, like you said, there are a lot of people who, who make price targets. And when you actually look at the reasoning behind their price targets, it's typically like, the grounding for the price targets is, is not usually a most a, a very highly sophisticated model. It's usually, and I'm not saying that I have a very sophisticated model either, but I'm just saying like, typically they'll look at a Bitcoin projection that seems reasonable. And then they'll look at what Ethereum is relative to that. And they'll say, okay, it'll be roughly this. 
Um, but the or thing, they use Metcalf's law, which I hear all the time. Um, they use, right. But even Metcalf's law, if you look at the way that that's being done, it's a regression on Bitcoin that then they apply to, to Ethereum and they say, well, if Ethereum grows and it gets value the same way that Bitcoin does per new active user in the network, you know, so it's just this, they're, they're doing two things. One is they're looking at, at, at price of Bitcoin. And then the second thing is they're assuming that the relationship between Ethereum and Bitcoin that was there in the past will hold in the future. Uh, and so I think that's where I get frustrated and, and my price targets get higher is because I think if you, if you look at it honestly, I think you think the market microstructure and, and the actual network is just very different. Um, right. You don't, you don't, you don't um, espouse any like value to kind of let's call it like correlation analysis between Ethereum and Bitcoin, as well as the broader, um, you know, crypto asset class. Like, is that a fair statement? I think it's, I think it's incredibly valuable for um, portfolio construction. Just like, you know, anyone who's thinking about how to construct a, a crypto portfolio, or I know a lot of people are thinking about crypto indexes and how best to think about constructing them. You have to look at the high degree of correlation uh, the, the key thing I want to point at is that just like correlations break. Like, where does the correlation come from, right? And that's like, if you see a statistical correlation today, what you're making a bet on is, is that that correlation will persist in the future. And what I'm saying is, okay, we can see that Ethereum has been highly correlated to Bitcoin. And we can also see how Ethereum has been covered in the media, how most investors understand Ethereum. We can see that it makes sense that it's highly correlated to Bitcoin because people don't know what Ethereum is. And to the extent that they know what it is, it's just because they know what Bitcoin is and they're making a Bitcoin bet. They just think it's like, oh, it's a little more risky. Like it's, they're making a high beta Bitcoin bet, right? Um, and so when, when Bitcoin sells off, Ethereum sells off right now. Uh, and in the future, and we can get into this more, but in the future, if, if you're buying Ethereum because you want to make a bet on the future of NFTs and Bitcoin sells off, like why would you sell your Ethereum? And so I think the key is they're seeing these correlations and they reflect investor preferences today. Uh, but I, I see those preferences changing in the future. And so I see correlations changing in the future. Um, and, and so cool. I just think, yep. yeah. So, so on that, maybe that's a good segue to, to 1559. Um, and what, what is going to break that correlation? Because I think, uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. These are very highly correlated Um assets and uh you know but but they are i mean they couldn't be more different um so let, let's walk through that i mean i'll, I'll kind of leave it pretty open-ended um sure. but what do you see coming with 1559 that folks are missing yeah i mean i think okay so the kind of big change with 1559 you have a change to the way that fee markets work right so gas fees which is the the price of transacting on ethereum uh, we're typically priced in just a pure auction, kind of a free for all. <laughs> um, so you'd put in your number of the gas that you want to transact with. You'd hope that it was high enough to get you into the block. And if it did, then your transaction would be cleared. It would go through, it'd be on the ledger. Um, and if it didn't clear, then like later, and, and I mean like sometimes hours later, you'd, you'd see, okay, my transaction failed. Uh, and it was frustrating as a user, um, but also it was... Um, a dynamic where all of those fees you paid were just going directly to the miners. Um, the implication of that is actually kind of goes, goes further than that because you can actually say there were people who argued, and I think this was kind of true in a weird way, that, that Ether, the asset, wasn't necessarily tied to the activity on the network um, because, I mean, it's kind of two things. One is, okay, if I interact more on the network, uh, what I'll do is I'll buy a lot of Ethereum, I'll use it to interact on the network, but then that Ethereum just goes to miners and they'll dump it back into the circulating supply, right? So if, if network activity before EIP-1559, if network activity went up a hundred times, that just means like the velocity of that money would increase, but it doesn't necessarily change like the value of the, of the, of the Ether, right? Um, what EIP-1559 says is we're not doing this kind of big auction where all the money goes to the miners anymore. Now we're going to do kind of two things. One is we're going to have a, a base fee for every block where you can be pretty well assured that if you pay that base fee, you'll get in. 
um, and then a tip, which kind of determines the speed of your transaction. So if, if before I would have to spend $15 to get into the block, uh, now I'll spend uh, $10 on a base fee and anywhere from $1 to $5 uh, on a tip. And if I spend the full $5, my transaction will go through in 30 seconds. If I spend uh, just $1, then my transaction might take you know 30 minutes, 45 minutes to go through. But I'm pretty reasonably assured that I'll get through because this base fee kind of guides the auction. I have some idea of what to what to bid on, right? Uh, and that really improves the user experience. Um, but then the key with the value accrual is that they take that base fee and they burn it. Uh, and I think the the estimates that I saw when I first wrote the report uh, were that thirty percent of the fees were going to get burned. And it'd be interesting. I actually haven't checked what the what the actual burn rates that we're seeing right now are now that it's live. Um, but that's crucially different because now if I transact uh, and we're just gonna, let's use 30% as our, our number for fee, for percent of fees that are burned. Is that, is that I, the 30%, does that imply that, that uh, you know, three, three and a third X of that is assumed to be a tip? Is uh, all the base yeah, so, fee burned? It, it, yeah, so exactly. It would, it would assume that, exactly, assume that the base fee was $3 and tip was $7 in this, in this kind of, um, okay. analysis exactly and the tip is going to the miners the base fee is being burned right uh, and so the way this changed the dynamic is now if i spend ten dollars in gas before all ten dollars was going to miners and after um seven dollars would go to miners and thirty and sorry three dollars would get burned um so suddenly ether becomes an investment asset like an investment grade asset right because suddenly you have a way for it to accrue the value of its product of the Ethereum network. Now, if the network activity increases by 10x, um, you're actually going to see a huge amount of Ether being burned. Um, and that is, is like a share buyback. The, if you own Ether and activity increases by 10x, um, the percentage of the supply you, you own is going to be increasing, just like a share buyback in equities. Um, so that's, I think, a, just a dramatic change to um, Ethereum as an asset. Uh, it changes uh, the way that, that the network activity kind of flows down to you know, the investment itself. Um, and that's incredibly uh, strong because the Ethereum network's been growing so fast, but it also will break that correlation because before this was all just speculation on, the, on adoption of these networks, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum. Now, if if Bitcoin kind of goes through a bear market and Ethereum starts tipping into the bear market as well, but someone builds an amazing product that gets you know, virally used, that's going to affect the Ethereum, like the Ether token uh, in a way that you know, it won't affect Bitcoin. That wasn't the case before, right? But now if, if this product is being used more, you should see that actually accrue to the token and the correlation should break. Uh, and that's kind of the bottom line, I think, with with EIP-1559, it ties the value of Ether to the value of the Ethereum network. And because the Ethereum network is so novel, so revolutionary, uh, the correlation should break to any other asset that isn't directly a part of the ecosystem. So one of the things that we you know, come across a lot um, in headlines, uh, especially amongst ETH Ether bulls, is that uh, you know, Ethereum will become deflationary. Um, and, and, and so, and I just want to get some nuance on that. What is the net, the projected net effect of fee burning? Meaning like, would you actually expect a decrease in circulating supply or would you just expect a, a decreasing rate of increase in circulating supply? Yeah. So it's really interesting. Um, first of all, I'll just say that it will vary, right? So in each block, you're getting a certain number of, of new ether that are mined right now. And, and in the future, under proof of stake, you'll get a new amount of ether that are issued to stakers. So this is just part of how you secure a blockchain. You have to, you have to reward the people who are securing the chain, and that's new issuance. Um, but OK, so then the question is, is this going to be deflationary? And the, the key to that is, are the fees that are burned going to be more than the ether that is issued for security, right? Um, and um, block by block, that will vary because gas fees have been so variable. Um, so we were, we were not expecting it to be deflationary until after the proof of stake merge, uh, because what's 
part of what's so significant about the merge is that it decreases the security budget. Uh, in other words, you because proof of stake is a more efficient means of securing the blockchain, you can do less issuance uh, to get the same mm -hmm. amount of security. If you can do less issuance, it makes it easier for the network to be deflationary. It can be deflating the circulating supply uh, with a lower amount of fees burned, right? Um, but I've been watching it. Uh, you can, there's some websites that let you track the, the burn and um, there have been a few deflationary blocks already. Um, and the reason for that has largely been kind of weird distortions in gas fee markets with NFTs that have been dropping uh, and gas fees spiking. Um, is looking at the yield on, uh, uh, on people who are currently locked up in ETH 2.0, I mean, is that, I mean, is that sort of a proxy for, um, you know, what the, the sort of gross inflation rate would be, you know, like, could you say, for example, like, okay, 10% of the network is, is staked. Yeah. Whatever that number, I don't know. I, and I think it's actually less than that, but let's just sure. use 10% as a round number yeah. and 10% of the network is getting issued a 6% yield. Um, therefore there's 0.6% inflation as a result of, so is that is that is that even logical math? Like I'm just trying to get so it's, it's, framework for what the uh, issuance would look like. So so today it's not logical math because uh, you know we're still mining it, right? But mm -hmm. you're in in a world after the merge. So in after the proof of stake merge, when all the security comes from staking, then the total all of the issuance is going to come from yes, it's from looking at the staking yield. Now, yeah. There's there's a key thing here though to to keep in mind is that. So right now, when you go on Coinbase and you stake your Ether, they're going to say, I can give you a 5 to 6% yield, right? And I have some of my Ether staked there. It's great, but it's not, it's like 5 to 6%. Okay, there are some equities with that yield. Um, so it's not like revolutionary. Uh, the reason it's just that 5 to 6% is that is just the, the yield from issuance, right? Um, after the merge, the fees that are going to miners, uh, they're not burned, they're going to miners. Uh, those fees will go to stakers as well. Uh, and so that's the key thing to keep in mind. Miners make their money in two ways. They make it from new blocks, they're mining, and they make it from getting a portion of fees, you know, the seven out of that $10, right? So when you look at Coinbase, what you're seeing is just yield from the new blocks. That's the five to 6%. Uh, but because stakers are not currently validating transactions, you're not seeing yield from the, the fees. Uh, and so when, you know, if, we see uh, staking yields go up to 20% after the merge. It would be incorrect to interpret that as an inflation, you know, uh, an issuance rate of 20%, because only a small part of that is, is new uh, Ether being issued to stakers. A good chunk of that 20% would be from fees being paid on the network that are not being burned, right? The remainder of the fees that are not it's being It's the burned. tip, effectively. Sorry? It's the tip. Yeah, exactly. It's the tip. And so you just don't want to kind of conflate those two. Um, the other thing I'd point out, though, is that's not the inflation rate. That's the maximum issuance. Uh, and this is what gets really interesting about talking about whether Ether will be deflationary or inflationary, because in each block, the question of whether or not total circulating supply has increased or decreased is, is a function of whether. So we, we know the issuance because we can look at the amount staked and how much they're getting paid. But you have to subtract that by the fees that got burned in that block, right? Mm -hmm. If more fees are burned than, than Ether that's issued, then you have a deflationary monetary policy, right? But you can see how this is going to be um, kind of like uh, in flux, right? Because if, if fees are really high for whatever reason, like they, they have been recently, then you're going to get a bunch of deflationary blocks. And if fees are really low, then you're going to get a bunch of inflationary blocks. Um, and so it makes for a really kind of, interesting question. A lot of people with like the ultrasound money discussion are have been kind of voting in favor of deflation, right? And I can understand that because they're saying, okay, this asset will be worth more if circulating supply is decreasing. Um, so hopefully, you know, growth of the network will increase fees and issuance will stay the same and, um, you know, we'll get, we'll get deflation. Um, I, I don't think that's necessarily an accurate kind of a view of it. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing seems like such a, a balancing act because you, you, you want to, I mean, ultimately, if you want a sustainable blockchain, you've got to, you know, sort of satisfy, you know, the, the speculators who are just like holding the token for the sake of making money sure. with the people who are actually using the network to 
transact for whatever purpose it might be, whether it's to buy, you know, digital goods or like an NFT or, um, or, or to do some DeFi thing or whatever, you know, whatever else gets built on, on top of this platform. Um, so, I mean, just kind of uh, on the, on the, ultra, on the ultrasound money topic, um, is that just sort of a narrative? Does it matter to your, um, yeah. your ultimate thesis? I mean, what, what's your sort of take on it? No, it does matter. And I do, for the record, I do think that Ethereum will be largely deflationary in the short term. So like my thesis that I posted on Sun Zero. Pre- pre-merge, you mean? Yeah, well, even even just post-merge. Um, so I post, the thesis I posted on Sun Zero was kind of a target of January, 2023. And I, I picked these dates. It's hard to predict times in, in the investment world. People know cool. that. And I picked these dates just because I see these gurus on CNBC saying all sorts of nonsense. And I, I think what differentiates a really high quality thesis is, is falsifiability. So I pick a date that in the future, you can call me up and say, hey, you were wrong. Uh, so that's why I picked <laughs> the date. Um, but you know, do I think, could it be a few months you know, here or there? Like, definitely. Um, but I think, I think if it's okay to, to answer that question, I just want to explain how gas prices work. Go for I think it. That's unintuitive to people. And it really, is kind of at the core. Like if we're trying to figure out if Ethereum is deflationary, we're projecting where will fee burn be in the future, right? And I think that's actually very different from projecting uh, where kind of the ether prices will be. So when I when I transact, it's an auction. And so when I transact, uh, and I'm let's say I'm buying one ether, um, I can choose to I can choose to pay whatever uh, price I think will get me into the into the network. And so if, if gas fees right now, in order to buy 10 ether, if I need to pay, sorry, if I need to buy $10 of ether uh, and I need to pay, you know, a dollar of gas, I'm paying like 10% transaction fees, right? Um, but the important thing to realize is that's not a fixed amount. That's just representing how valuable transacting on the network is to uh, users today, right? So if, if everyone was looking at gas fees and thinking they're too high, I don't want to do this, gas fees would just go lower. It's an auction, right? So people would just stop bidding those prices. Gas fees would decline, right? And so um, gas fees represent like an opportunity cost, right? So it's, if, if I choose not to buy Ethereum because gas fees are too high, um, then uh, the question is, I'm gonna, what am I missing out on, right? And the reason that's interesting is when you see these huge volatility spikes, people see gas prices going up. And that's because you're suddenly missing out on something big, right? If Ethereum's going up 10% in a day, you're like, okay, maybe it's worth paying up for gas because I just want to get the Ethereum now while it's going up. And similarly, when when the Ethereum price is, is just crashing, you'll see gas prices spike upwards too. Because now people are like, I got to get out. Like, sure, I have to pay like excessive gas fees, but I got to get out, right? Um, that's really important because gas fees on the Ethereum network are priced in Ether. Uh, and that confuses people. They think, okay, if Ethereum goes up 100x, gas fees must also go up 100x. And they see Ethereum price rising and they see gas fees rising. Um, but that example of seeing Ethereum's price falling and gas fees rising should make it clear that gas fees are only indirectly linked to the price of Ethereum. What they really represent is just the value of transacting. How important, how urgent is it for you to transact? Um, and that's really important too, because the value of transacting is largely actually going to be dictated by you know U.S. dollar value of the gas fees. Um, because if I own, if I want to buy ten dollars of of ten dollars worth of ether, because maybe my salary is being paid in U.S. dollars, right? So I only have uh, ten dollars to spend. Um, and I look at gas fees, uh, the, the amount of ether that I'm paying is, is one obstacle, but I'm really going to be thinking about it in terms of like my purchasing power, right? And similarly, like it, once gas fees get above a certain dollar amount is when people are going to start bulking at it. They're going to be like, okay, wait a second. I don't have enough money to be spending $300 on gas. Um, and so I think that's really, really important uh, because when people look at it in, in terms of ether, they get a little confused. Um, but I'd ask that if you're modeling this, try to look at the US dollar value of gas fees and the US dollar value of the issuance. Okay, so if let's say in our model that, that 10 new ETH is being issued uh, every day, I would say, look, look at the 10 ETH, but multiply it by the price of Ether 
So you get the US dollar value of that issuance. Um, and then the reason I say that is because gas fees are gonna be moving with people's purchasing power in US dollar terms. And so if, uh, if you look at fee burn, you can also look at the US dollar value of that and you subtract them and you'll get inflation or deflation. Uh, and the reason that matters is because when these markets dislocate, when, when price goes up more than fee burn, for instance, it'll be because the fee burn is, is gonna be more related to people's purchasing power how much they're willing to spend on gas is going to be more willing, more related to how much U.S. dollars they have uh, to invest in other things and buy groceries. Uh, and the price of ether is going to is going to be kind of different, a speculative asset that has different supply and demand dynamic. Um, so you don't, I, I take it you don't buy into an outcome where there is a net deflation that just occurs indefinitely that could erode the entire supply of. No, no. So and the reason that's why that's why it's kind of tricky with ultrasound money, right? Because I think what's interesting is as the network grows, either if each transaction becomes more valuable to the user. So like if right now you're using the Ethereum network to speculate in your free time, maybe it has a certain value to you. But in the future, if your salary is being paid through a smart contract, maybe that transaction is incredibly more valuable. Maybe corporations are paying gas. So maybe the gas per transaction could increase, right? Similarly, if more people are using the network, maybe we have higher gas fees. And so over time, if gas goes up and you know, fees are, more fees are being burned, I think price will go up with it, right? But if price is going up, uh, the key question is, is price going up kind of faster than, than fees are going up? Because um, if the price is going up more than, than gas is going up, then at the end, when you net it all out, you're actually just not going to see deflation. Um, you're just going to see gas go kind of down in ETH terms. So like if, to make this kind of concrete, let's say you're paying $1 of, uh, what, you're paying one ETH and that's $3,500 in gas, right? Uh, if, if ether spikes 10 times, um, what's most likely in my view to happen is not that you're still going to pay one ETH in gas and it's going to be thirty $35,000. I, I don't think that'll happen. I think most likely that gas will go down in ether terms. You'll pay, you know, 0.5 ETH and you'll, you'll end up paying more in dollars to transact on the network, but less in ether, right? And because you're paying less in ether, less ETH will be burned and you won't have deflation. But what is the exact, um, I guess, mechanism by which gas fees are set? It's, 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 is it just a, a pure function of like overall network congestion? Meaning like, let's say there's a huge spike in ether price because there's just more hodling going on. So you have more hodling, um, higher prices, but less actual network activity. That would be a scenario where, you know, the fees in ETH terms are actually going down, meaning like the net fee burn is going down. But yeah, exactly. You could see, exactly. You could see a high amount of hodling where, um, you know, ETH goes skyrockets and the price is stable at a very high price. Um, and then you could see like a, a period of low volatility where people are just not that interested in, in transacting. And then you would have, yeah, you'd have a situation where gas fees would be much lower because people aren't desperate to, to buy. Lower in ETH terms. Yeah, well, potentially yeah, lower in ETH terms because the price of Ether went up. Um, but also if people are just like if, if you have low volatility, people might not be like, oh, I have to go transact right now. And so it could be lower in dollar terms too. Um, the, the reason they'll typically track though is just because if, if the value of my position is higher, like if I'm willing to spend 1% on transaction fees and my position goes up 10X, then the amount I'm willing to pay in fees is, is gonna go up by 10X, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so typically there is an indirect relationship between the price of ether and the fees, yeah. right? but it's not a, it's not a direct causal one. It's, it's just about how people are thinking about what they're willing to pay. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, and I guess in theory, if there are a lot of hodlers, maybe the speed of transaction on the day that they actually do want to sell isn't as important, meaning they're not as sensitive to like ether moving, you know, if ether's at 20,000, they don't care if they get out at $10 more or less. Yeah, it, it could maybe, go either way, right? Exactly. Yeah. Like if, you, if that was the mentality and the gas markets reflect that urgency, right? So right. actually that's interesting. We've had, the reason gas prices have been so high is we've had these huge NFT drops, right? And uh, there's a lot of urgency and I actually saw an interesting take where people were saying that 
when these NFTs are kind of sold in pre-sale, uh, they're sold at a price where a lot of people realize they'll be able to resell them at a higher price. So if you know that you can buy an NFT for, for one ETH that you can resell the next day for two, uh, you're willing to spend up to one ETH in gas fees because you'll still profit, right? Mm -hmm. That's that difference. And so gas fees will spike up to one ETH, right? And so, and so right. that's kind of, I mean, obviously gas fees didn't spike to one ETH. So I made up some numbers there, but that's an example of kind of like what, what's been happening is, is you, you have these drops where suddenly participating, people are willing to spend incredibly high gas in order to get in on these transactions. So gas fees spike. And sure, the price of Ether is going up a little bit, but it's not really affecting the price of Ether, right? Indirectly long-term, but uh, these markets are separate, right? So one of the most interesting things you, you, you recently you know, noted on SunZero is that you had originally underestimated the percent of the Ethereum community that was that would be willing to stake their ether, and uh, I, I think in your original report, you had sort of assumed something around a twenty or thirty percent stake rate. Um, yeah. But you actually think that number could be significantly higher than that. Uh, can you explain that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so my initial estimate of what people were willing to stake was was a very just. Um, I don't know, it was just kind of like a naive look at yields, right? So I was looking at yields and I was saying, okay, um, the way that yield works is the more people that stake, uh, the less, the lower the yield goes uh, because it's the, the total security budget stays relatively fixed. So um, the idea is if, if I can get, you know, if I can get 10 times the number of people to stake, I don't necessarily need to pay them more to get them to stake then I won't, I'd, I'd rather not. And so instead the yields just go down and there's kind of a minimum issuance that kind of is there just to make sure the security never goes below a certain amount. Um, but this idea that we don't need extra security. And so as you see more staked ether, uh, you, you'll see yields fall. Um, and so when I looked at that, I was like, okay, um, if we're projecting that out of the gate, we'll have yields of 20%, that's unsustainable. Um, for an asset that's that's a high growth asset that has uh, a way to accrue the value of the network for it to have a yield of 20%. It's just a no brainer buy, collect the yield, set and forget bet. And unlike Bitcoin, it's not set and forget and, and kind of be freaked out about what's gonna happen. You can just take that yield. And if it's a 20% yield, you can say, okay, like unless this thing completely collapses in five years, I'm gonna basically make the value of my investment and just yield. Um, so I was like, okay, yields are going to go down. People are going to stake. This is a no brainer. And the question is at what point will they stop staking? And I was looking at it and I was thinking maybe 7%, throw a number out there. The idea would be some yield that represents the fact that Ethereum is seen as a risk asset, but also the fact that a 20% yield is just too high. Um, and especially in a yield starved world like today. Um, and so I, um, forgetting some of the numbers off the top of my head, but I remember looking at that and thinking, I think it was roughly 20% that I thought would be staked based on an estimate using that approach. Um, but then I started thinking a little bit more about how sophisticated actors could take advantage of this yield. Uh, because Ether is interesting. You, when you buy Ether and it's not staked, you don't get a dividend. Um, and so... You, you have to do something. You have to take your ether and you have to stake it. Um, and that actually changes the nature of the asset because when it's staked, you can't sell it. <laughs> you, can't, you, can't trans you can't use it. Uh, staked ether can't be burned because if it was burned, it wouldn't be staked, <laughs> right? Um, right. And so, so that's a, a huge difference. And actually kind of concretely, because uh, I know we have some like money managers in the audience. Uh, it's interesting because you can, you can hedge out risk. Uh, so one thing I realized is, uh, you know, Take a simple trade. If if the yield was at 20%, I would buy Ether and stake it, and I would go to the futures market, and I would short the same amount of Ether, okay? And as long as that future represent unstaked Ether, my short position, maybe you have to pay a borrow rate, but I'm not paying the yield, right? And so I can actually arbitrage out the price risk of my Ether position and just capture that yield. Um, and so I was kind of looking into like dividend swaps and other weird securities, but these markets exist, right? Like you can isolate the yield of an asset uh, and you can see how it trades. And it, it seems pretty obvious to me that that yield would not stay at 20% if it, if it didn't involve the risk of 
Ether's price, and you were just getting a yield purely based on um, like the risk that staking failed or uh, you know, the risk that the borrow costs of the short were too high or something like that, right? Um, so 20% is way too high for that. Uh, it would go much, much, much lower. Uh, and so um, the question then is, is 7% uh, where it would go at? I think when you look at just kind of arbitrage trades, uh, you're looking at quote unquote, a risk-free trade. You never see these spreads at 7% unless it's impossible to close the spread, right? But in this case, it's really easy to close the spread because sure you're short ETH, but you actually already own the ETH. <laughs> um, and so just like merger arbitrage, it's like merger arbitrage where I control when the merger happens. Whenever I want to close this position, I could just unstake my ETH and I can kind of close my short because I, I own the ETH, it's just staked, right? And I can choose to unstake it whenever I want after the merge, right? Uh, and so my thesis is before the merge, when you can't quickly unstake your ETH, uh, you won't see this relationship. People are hesitant to stake because there's risk there. You're, you're locking up your ETH. You're not going to be able to get it back until the merge. And the merge is a major risk event. Um, but after the merge happens, it removes this risk from the table and it becomes very easy to stake and unstake. Um, and I think you'll actually see uh, this kind of arbitrage trade driving significant inflows to stake a large portion of ETH, where I'll just continue to buy more and more staked ETH uh, and short it on the future side and kind of grab that yield. Um, the other, the other um, I think part of your thesis had to do with the notion of these uh, staking pools that offer something called staked ETH um, in exchange for Ether that's yeah. been staked. Um, what does that do in terms of the, let's say, arbitrage ability of, of this trade? Yeah, so it actually is, it's really great because it makes this trade so much easier to pull off. Uh, so the way that I just explained it is I think just an example that I think a lot of managers are very familiar with. It doesn't take a, a lot of crypto experience to understand. Um, but I think the real way that this trade will go down is not by, you know, by buying ETH and shorting uh, uh, ETH, it's going to be through what are called staking derivatives. And so the way this works is instead of staking it myself, I'll take my one Ether, I'll go to Coinbase because I think they've actually announced that they're going to have a staking derivative. So I could give you an example. I could say Coinbase, but there's going to be a number of platforms, Lido Finance, Rocket Pool, uh, a number of platforms that do this. So I say, okay, Coinbase, I'd like to stake my Ether. And they would say, okay, in order to encourage you to do that, I'll give you a liquid token called STETH uh, that, and one STETH is, is, it represents the rights to own that, that ether that was staked. Okay, and the nice thing about STETH is that I can buy and sell it, right? Um, where my staked ether was, was just locked up and it was hard to access, um, STETH I can buy and sell, and that is really useful. One thing is, it's just useful because now uh, if I've staked my ether and I wanna get out of my position, I could just sell it to someone else without unstaking it. Um, and because my ether represents the value of one ether plus the staking cash flows, um, it should be worth more as staked ETH than as unstaked ETH, right? As long as yields are some meaningful amount. And so if I'm wrong and, and yields stay at 7%, then we should see ST ETH trade at a significant premium to ETH. And if it doesn't, there's just free money on the table uh, because you can, buy the ST ETH and you're getting the value of your ETH, but you're getting this free yield on top. Um, so my theory is that this is kind of how the arbitra arbitrage trade will work, which is just that um, anytime ST ETH trades for less than one ETH, uh, you can arbitrage that instantly because you can take your ST ETH to Coinbase or take it to Lido Finance and you can say, you know, this ST ETH is worth redeemable for the value of one ETH. So just give it back to me. Uh, and if ST ETH is trading for you know, 0.95 ETH, then I'll buy as much ST ETH as I can and redeem it for one ETH and get that spread, right? Um, so ST ETH can never trade for lower. Uh, and then it should be worth more, but it actually works the other way too. And this is where it kind of gets weird because in other arbitrage trades, you can't do this. But if ST ETH is worth you know, 1.1 ETH, well, all I have to do is buy one ETH, go to a provider and say, hey, 
I have one ETH. You have to give me one ST ETH. <laughs> and, and I have it now. And, and on the market, it's selling for 1.1. And I just got it for one, right? And so I got that spread on the other side. So, so my just long- really quickly, I, I just want to, there's something a little unsettling about the idea that you buy one ETH and um, you go to Lido or one of these other derivative uh, you know, providers and, and they just create this new security or, or token, whatever you want to call it, um, out of thin air um, that's liquid, even though the underlying is not because it's been staked. Um, how do you reconcile that? Well, so there it's, there's kind of two things. Um, one is after the merge, the underlying will be liquid. So in theory, it, like when I say you can redeem your ST ETH for ETH, right? Where is Lido getting these ETH from? Um, you know, in practice, they might have a, a treasury so that they don't have to unstake any ETH. I don't know. But in theory, you know, every ST ETH should be backed by one staked ETH. And if you redeem it, it's actually more liquid than the markets because they, they don't have to get it from the market. They actually have it already. It's staked. And all they have to do is unstake it and give it to you. Um, so it's just a claim. It's so like- post, um, You're saying post-merge, they can unstake it. Post-merge. Maybe there's some transaction fee there, but for the most part, it's pretty fr- frictionless. Exactly. Post-merge, it's just- uh, when you stake your ETH, they're just holding it for you, like, you know, a bank account. Uh, and you can, if you sell it, then they'll just say, okay, he, he sold it. So um, in the account, I'm going to reflect that this Ether is no longer owned by him. It's owned by whoever bought it, right? Or instead of selling it to someone else, you could just go to the bank. You can say, I just want my money in cash and they'll just give it to you, right? Um, so pre-merge, how do these things work? Because you, you yeah, can go now to, to Lido and, and get your staked ETH as well. Yeah. So pre-merge, it's not going to be as liquid. And I, you know, I'm not sure if they even allow redemptions right now because they wouldn't okay. be able to give it to you. Right. And that's okay. why actually, if you look at the price of ST ETH, like Lido's ST ETH right now, it doesn't trade for a premium to ETH. Sometimes it actually trades for less. And that's because you can't, you can't close the arbitrage right now. So if you can buy ST ETH for 0.97 ETH, like good for you, but you can't get one ETH from that until after the merge. So, and that so spread- actually, I mean, that would imply that right now the play would be to just buy stakes ETH directly in the market somehow because if- post-merge, it'll, it'll appreciate. So, so ST ETH should never be worth less than, exactly. I, I think if, if you look at ST ETH, maybe right, let's say it sells for 0.98 ETH right now, right? Uh, and maybe a fair value based on the yields that you'll get is something more like 1.05 ETH, right? Because the you could do a discounted cash flow of that yield. So that's a spread of, I don't know, something like six or seven percent. Um, yeah, it's a good investment, but realize it's just like mer- merger arbitrage, right? So that spread represents the risk that the merge doesn't go through, mm-hmm. right? And that's exactly what that represents. And so if you think the merge is going to go through, and you want to try to try to like uh, do a risk-free bet, just isolate that bet. Yeah, you could buy ST ETH, you could short ETH, and you could just wait because eventually that that spread should close uh, and the ST ETH should kind of be worth more than the ETH and you should get I don't know, a good 6 7% risk-free, um, but risk-free because that risk you're taking is the risk of the merge. And I'd argue that the bigger upside if you're betting on the merge is just to buy ETH directly right now. Yeah. So, but going back to the the original question, which had to do with the percent of ether that's staked. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> post merge, uh, you know, which right now I think I think folks are predicting um, March twenty twenty two. What is the what's going to drive the percent of ether staked, say to fifty percent or higher? Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. It's like if you, I was looking at the the yield schedule and I was looking at it saying, okay, if it's 7%, maybe we'll get 20%, 25% stake, something like that. Um, But if you look at, if you look at what really drives that yield as a function of arbitrage, because if yields are 3% and I can still keep arbitraging the staked versus unstaked ETH, then what really matters is just what should the arbitrage spread be? What's the fair value for, for that spread between ST ETH and ETH, which because it's directly redeemable, like I could just, it's not like a merger where I'm taking on merger risk. I can just go to the service and grab it right now in real time 
whenever I'm worried, I can close the spread myself. I would expect that spread to be very thin. And I think that that spread will actually be more dictated by the gas prices involved in, in just buying and selling the STE than the risk of, of not being able to redeem it just because I can go on the market anytime I want and, and close that spread. Um, like I think people will, people are smart. I think people are going to write algorithms to do this trade. You know, just check if the cost to execute the trade is, is higher than the reward of closing the spread and just close it in real time, like constantly. What that means for the percent staked is that the yields will go far below 7%. I think, you know, it's hard to say exactly where they'll be because it requires a prediction of gas prices. Um, but if we're seeing yields of like one to 2%, that's where I look and start saying, we're going to get percent staked higher than 50%. Like all of the circulating supply of unstaked ETH is just going to get funneled into this trade is kind of how I'm viewing it at least. And, and the reason it can be funneled in this trade is because you can get out of it without unstaking your ETH. Like once you're done, you don't need to get out of this trade by unstaking your ETH. You can get out of this trade by selling someone else your staked ETH. And so eventually this trade is not going to go on forever. And the way that this trade closes is by staked ETH reaching 50 plus percent of circulating supply. Uh, so yeah, that, I mean, that was kind of the thought there. And I think it's really significant when you look at price, because again, the price action doesn't show this. And so if you're looking at historical prices, you're not going to see this coming. Yeah, I, I, I wonder, you know, on the arbitrage front, how many institutional funds or individuals are kind of set up to do this kind of thing. Um, yeah. And I'm not even sure it would take that many to do it for it to start having an impact, um, which is... I, I think if if no one does it, it you know, FTX, have you, have you heard of SBF Alameda? Uh, they, have like uh, a, they have like a market making fund and there's, there's a number of... of Right, pretty, pretty high quality quant crypto funds. Uh, right, they're just going to eat through this trade, right? And the only reason they're not doing it now is because it can't be done before the merge. But I don't think it takes. It, it's not like a normal stock where it takes people finding the trade. Like these are publicly traded securities. Everyone's going to know about staking derivatives. Um, these exchanges are going to list like they're going to list them. Like Coinbase is going to have a listed staking derivative right next to its listed ETH price. People are going to see this and it, all it takes is one person just to sit and do this over and over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like it's so, and because it can be done in real time, right? That's the, that's the thing is, um, and so, you know, initially there'll be some distortions. Uh, I write in my report about how uh, when proof of stake, when the merge happens, there's a validator queue. Uh, so you won't be able to stake and unstake immediately on the day of the merge because there'll be so much kind of like influx to stake. Um, but over time, the trade will approximate frictionless staking and unstaking. Uh, and once that kind of decongests, you're going to see staking staking above 50% uh, for sure, I think. I mean, this just reminds me of the like hedge fund industry in the 90s, where, you know, there were, there were just like, there was free money to be made all over the place. And like, yeah. you, you know, like a lot of folks just weren't paying attention but then eventually all these, you know, these arbitrage holes got filled. Um, and, and the crazy thing about this is, right, just to bring it back to what we were talking about earlier, where I was saying, you know, there's a very high percentage of Bitcoin that is being hodled. And you were asking me, well, how do these changes affect, you know, ETH hodling, right? And, and one thing I've been really trying to pound the table on is that staked ETH, it's like economically enforced hodling, right? Because if you can, instead of unstaking it, if you can just sell it to someone else, you're never going to unstake it. And that ETH is never going to rejoin the circulating supply. Uh, it's always going to be staked. There's going to be a circulating supply of staked ETH. Separately, there's going to be a circulating supply of unstaked ETH, right? Um, and so, so that means, you know, this is economically enforced hodling. There's no like fear or cultural change that's going to cause these hodlers to suddenly sell. They're not going to say, okay, like, it's time for me to sell my, my stake and go to the beach. Like you would just sell it as staked ether. Um, and then this kind of begs the question of like, why is unstaked ether going to, to set the price? Uh, and it's ultimately, it always comes back to fees can only be burned by unstaked ether. And so if you want to transact on Ethereum, you have to burn unstaked ether. So if you've staked over 50% of the supply, and you want to transact, you have to buy that unstaked ether 
from that smaller pool and that's going to set the price. Has your price target changed at all since your original report? I mean, it's not really. I mean, I, I would say my my initial report was was pretty big, um, and I I covered a lot of this, right? So uh, all the like EIP fifteen fifty nine was the expects of it was in there, you know, months ago when I wrote it. Um, staking and the supply shock was in there. I didn't incorporate the like amount of supply shock, but what I would say is that the difference between thirty percent staked and fifty percent staked. I don't know that I can say that that will all be baked into the market before January, 2023, right? So like, it'll take time for this arbitrage trade to right. happen. Um, this arbitrage trade to happen. So I haven't necessarily uh, incorporated it to change my prediction by January, 2023. I think that's a pretty stable target. I think the biggest thing that I've started to shift on though is, is kind of what happens after that, uh, because when I initially wrote the report, I was just making a, an 18 month projection. This was a trade uh, and it still is you know, an investment. And if I thought price was gonna go down, I would get out of it. But I think I've become more optimistic on, on price uh, going up and staying higher for longer and, and kind of the longer term trajectory is what I've got. Did, did you second guess any of your thoughts on Ethereum during the most recent crash? I mean, it, it was in the 1700s, yeah. like a few yeah. weeks. I mean, I'd be lying to say I didn't have my concerns. I started racking my brain, like, what am I missing? Like the price is going down. I mean, it was the first, I'm new to this, right? So uh, a lot of people had been through that crash in 2017 and I, I wasn't, uh, I got into this run Bitcoin's having in 2020. And so first crash of that- You were very was, lucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. My timing was perfect uh, when you think yeah. about it in retrospect, but so yeah, I, ha I had some doubts. The problem is I could never ground the new fundamentals. Like I. I was like, price is dropping. And then I was thinking, well, nothing that I wrote about in my report that was supposed to push price up has happened yet, right? Like EIP 1559 hadn't happened yet. Proof of stake, the merge hadn't happened yet. And so if price is dropping after the merge, like that's gonna be very concerning to me uh, because that's my thesis really kind of focuses on this period of time where you have this supply shock, but um, that all that price, action was before that. And so I was like, okay, all well, the time here is- Yeah, I think, I think to your point on the price dropping post-merge, the reason that would happen, I mean, I guess one reason that would happen is like suddenly all these people who have staked their ether like decide actually they don't want to, they, they, don't, they don't want to stake it anymore. And now they're no, lo they're no longer locked into it. Um, mm -hmm. You, I guess, would argue that that's unlikely because of the- well, like, I would argue that's unlikely for a few reasons. One is uh, instead of instead of unstaking it, they could they could sell you a staking derivative, uh, and and that wouldn't affect the circulating supply of ether. So as long as there's demand for that staked ETH, um, they they really don't have to get out of it by by increasing the circulating supply of unstaked ether. Um, but the other thing is, so think about the mindset. So people who stake right now. Um, they're, they're, they're in it for at least 18, they're in it for a long time, right? They, they bought ether very early on and they bought it for a, a yield during that time period that was much lower than it will be in the future. Um, so these are the kinds of people who are, these are the hodlers, right? Like, will you see people staking for, for less passionate reasons in the future? Absolutely, when there's lower risk, right? But these are the people who are willing to take on the maximum risk. Like they've been through multiple EIP 1559, proof of stake. These are people who are staking all through of that. And if something went wrong, they would have no way out and they knowingly decided to stake it anyways. So the idea that, that they took that risk and that they're just can't wait to cash out the minute that you can, uh, you can do that is I'm skeptical. But I, I think even if they did cash out even to some extent, uh, I, I don't think it would affect circulating supply of unstaked ETH. And I think that's what counts. So yeah, it's not something that I'm too worried about. What I do think is probably gonna happen is that at least initially, uh, a lot of the yield that people are getting is not gonna get restaked, right? So I think a lot of people are gonna, the way they're gonna take their cash is they're gonna say, well, look, if I, if I bought all this ETH and staked it and I'm getting a 20% yield, like I'll just, I'll just sell the, the yield part, you know? Uh, Cause that's quite a bit of cash flow, especially because ETH has already gone up by 5X 
or more than that. So they're getting their entire initial investment back and just yield at that point. Um, right. So no need to unstake it to reduce their risk, you know? Um, and, and, and just to, to get to the yield specifically, so you're taking the 6% or so staking reward and adding fees. You know, 14, fees. 14% or whatever, like, how are you getting to that, that fee number? Like what, what, what should people reasonably expect yeah, it was uh, the yield breakup to be. It'll it'll start high because a lot of people will not have staked, right? It's variable about the percentage of ETH that's been staked, really just the number of ETH that's been staked. So that's why when I say like 20%, I think that was a reasonable estimate I saw from uh, an Ethereum researcher, Justin Drake, um, looking at kind of where we can expect yields to be initially just off the bat. Um, but then it will go lower than that um, just as more people stake uh, and that yield is being distributed over more ether, uh, it'll drop. And I think, you know, like I've argued, I think yields are going to go near zero with the arbitrage trade. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just on the timeline itself, uh, obviously proof of stake has been delayed numerous times. Um, what, what do you think now, as far as like, you know, how much credibility to put in the, the new timeline, the, the Q1 2022 timeline for, sure. for the merge? I mean, I think you can kind of look at 1559, the fact that fees are currently being burned as kind of a evidence that the, the developers, they can execute, they can come to a consensus and execute, uh, even if it's a decentralized consensus, which is pretty impressive. Uh, and they can pull off a project like this, which is pretty awesome. Um, so I think it reduces the execution risk from the perspective of proof of stake happens and it goes poorly because we've seen that the team can execute, they can reduce the risk by you know, really auditing their code and doing a great job. Um, as far as timeline, like the possibility of delay absolutely exists. Um, these are really high stakes projects. And I think part of the fact that the team is executing without a mistake has to do with the fact that if they need more time, they're just asking for it, right? And so um, could it be delayed farther? It's absolutely possible. Uh, and I know people will keep saying, okay, but then it'll never happen. But they said that about 1559 too. Um, so I think that's unlikely. The other thing I would say though, is that um, we've seen a lot of uh, you know, attacks on the network with, and I, it's just too much to go into here, but uh, minor extractable value, MEV, has been a topic of discussion, uh, reorganizations. Um, and then I think earlier, there were a lot of discussions about just miners and uh, kind of the negotiating power of miners in preventing the merge. And the answer to all of this has always been that we need to credibly be able to merge tomorrow. Because then if, even if we need more time to audit the code, if we can credibly say, I can merge tomorrow if you attack the network, then attackers really don't have much to stand on. And so when you look at the discussions amongst kind of crypto security people, um, having the merge sooner rather than later uh, has been a priority. So. I think when you just look at the delays on their face value, you see this kind of, okay, if it's been delayed in the past, it's probably gonna be delayed in the future. But when you kind of take a, a look under the hood, what you see is they, there's a published checklist of like things that need to get done before the merge. And it's the kind of checklist I would want for a developer of a product with a huge release. I want them to hit every item on that list. I don't want proof of stake to have a mistake. And if it takes a little bit of time, like I think investors should be okay with that. In the same way that if a company said, look, we're delaying our product release because we wanna make it perfect. As long as the product does come out and it's actually high quality, like investors would be happy with that. Same for ETH. So what would you say are the biggest risks to the Ethereum story today? Yeah, um, I think, the biggest risk is is always going to be the merge. Everything comes down to the merge. Um, you know, fifteen fifty nine has an effect on the selling pressure that I discussed in my report. But the merge, because it decreases issuance by so much, the merge is really like the focal point of the entire thesis. Um, and so, if the merge kind of doesn't go through, or it goes through and it fails, or something like that. Uh, that's the primary risk. And the, what they're doing, which is replacing the consensus engine of the blockchain in real time, cannot be underestimated um, is how difficult a task that is. Uh, so I just think keeping that front and center is the risk. Um, I think some other risks that have popped up on the radar that are really difficult to assess in real time are regulatory risks, right? Because we've seen this discussion of the infrastructure bill. 
a lot of that stuff is still playing out and kind of unsettled. And it's just hard to say, one, it's hard to say like what that will be. And then two, it's hard to say like what the effects will be on, uh, you know, the growth of the ecosystem long-term. Um, so I would say that, you know, part of the reason there's so much upside here is there is so much uncertainty, so many different balls in the air to keep track of from regulation to execution risk to even if this thing does go through, how does it affect circulating supply? Um, but I do think that's where my edge is. You know, when people say like, why do you think you know something that other people don't know? I just think that how many people in the world do you think are keeping track of, of the regulatory situation, the execution risk, and then going deeper and thinking about the arbitrage trade. I just don't think that, I don't think I've spoken to anyone who's really kind of incorporating all of this into their investment analysis. And so I think that's where investors today who do understand this can reasonably say they have an edge over the market. And what would you say about the risks of just competing blockchains? Do you, do you see that as a longer term risk? Not really a, like, yeah. not a risk as far as the merge date is concerned, but but maybe a, a two or three or four year kind of time frame risk? Right. Yeah. So I didn't mention it in my report very much because I don't think that it's something that will affect uh, the price of Ethereum by January 2023. But then when you do look out farther, uh, it's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, I'm taking a, a good look at Solana and Polkadot. Uh, it's really important when you look at these projects that you kind of, you really have to talk to people in the community, understand what's being actually used, uh, look for projects that are actually providing services um, because there's just a lot of junk in the space. Um, people have to be very careful about diversifying in this space. It's like counterintuitive. Experienced investors are gonna come in and say, well, if I like uranium, I'll buy a basket of uranium miners to get thematic exposure to the space. You do that in crypto and 90% of your portfolio is going to be like <laughs> fraudulent and yeah. like, you know, useless. And so you really have to be careful um, with what you're buying. But yeah, long-term, I think there's going to be some interesting competitive networks that have a lot of different things to offer for different use cases. Um, Ultimately, there's a shelling point effect though, where the biggest network is the most secure with the most infrastructure available. So new products will, will more easily kind of jump into the new networks than the old networks. I think the biggest thing we're seeing that actually for is, is like formatting. So the Ethereum virtual machine, everything runs on it. Uh, and it's very hard to not run on it if you want to build a useful product because it's like you have, if you're not EVM compatible, then you're just not compatible is what things are like right now. So, you know, could that change? We'll have to watch and see. Um, the same thing works with NFTs. Like everything is, is, you know, an ERC 20 token or an ERC something token. Um, but if, if you build an NFT that is not compatible with the Ethereum blockchain right now, you're building an NFT that's really difficult to do stuff with. And so it depends on why you're making your NFT. Maybe the goal is just to collect it. You can do that easily on other chains, but uh, the more this, this thing develops to have more and more use cases and increase like network activity, the more important this like ecosystem is going to be. And I think people really shouldn't underestimate how much that's already been built out on Ethereum and the disparity between Ethereum and the next competition is just so high. Yeah. So do you have any data on like network activity that like has gotten you kind of excited in, in terms of, you know, the sort of momentum that Ethereum is building as an ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, you can see overall fee growth has been been rising really dramatically. I don't have the numbers in front of me, uh, but it's been happening fast. I think I I think I saw a report. Um, I'm forgetting the source, uh, so you have to fact check me on this. But I think I saw a report that said uh, ninety percent of developers uh, are on the Ethereum ecosystem compared to uh, other projects, and so when you look at that, it's like 90% of the developers are in Ethereum uh, in this entire space. So that is, you know, functionally all of the development that's happening in crypto is happening on the Ethereum network. Um, so when you're, when you're betting on uh, activity in other ecosystems, you really, I think at this point, you're mostly betting that Ethereum is going to fail. Um, or you're betting that maybe that this new blockchain will have a small niche and that it's just relatively underpriced compared to that niche. But um, uh, like big picture, I think if you really are believing in the space, it's really hard not to make that bet expressed through just buying a claim on it, the Ethereum network, yeah. 
Are there any uh, blockchains that you, you kind of know of as just being just pure hot air, like in terms of, you know, yeah. Ethereum killers, like I, you always see these, I always see these YouTube videos where the title's like Ethereum killer, you know, yeah. and it's some blockchain. For building layer one blockchains, there's this trade-off between security, uh, it's a trade-off between security, scalability, and decentralization, where it's really easy to get something that's highly centralized uh, so it trades off the decentralization, but then it, it's scalable uh, and secure, but it's only scalable and secure because it's centralized, right? Similarly, it's able to get easy to get something that's not scalable at all, but very decentralized and very secure. And then so these, these three elements trade off of each other. And so when you're looking at a new layer one blockchain, if it doesn't really have a take on where it fits and how it optimizes in that framework, it's usually doesn't have anything to offer. Um, I don't know. I, I feel bad about saying this, but I, I look at Cardano and I, it's tough. Like there's nothing really that, that I can do on it right now because they don't have smart contracts yet. Um, and if you look at the list of, of crypto by market cap, it's priced higher than a lot of really promising alternative layer one blockchains. Right. And so I, I guess the way to look at that is just like, um, like a biotech company with a lot of hype behind his product. It's like, Sure. Like if, if, you know, if the drug comes out and the FDA approves it, maybe this thing is worth like whatever its market cap is, but like the price reflects that this product is going to you know, be approved. It's going to be adopted and everyone's going to use it. And, and if all this happens, maybe you get to today's price. Right. So there's a lot of downside. And I see Cardano the same way where it's like, look, maybe they come out with something that's amazing and it optimizes scalability without trading off something else. Uh, but right now what we have is, is, a layer one blockchain with no services, you know, a fraction, a tiny fraction of the users because users can't do anything on it uh, and a lot of promises. And so if all the promises come true, it'll like satisfy its current price. But um, I don't know, it just makes me skeptical. I don't have like a, a good short seller case, like as far as what things would go wrong to actually make it move. And I want to be wrong. I want this product to change the world. And for me to come back and say, look, like yeah. this was a game changer, but right now. It's just do, you, do you have any um, view on Bitcoin? Um, yeah. I mean, Bitcoin is sort of, it, it's like a known quantity. Um, and I think people uh, like that about it. I think like I expressed, I think Bitcoin has a very like tried and true approach to how price goes up, which is just that like, Everyone knows like what you do to make money in Bitcoin is you dollar cost average in a constant dollar amount over time. So the circulating supply decreases and then a halving event happens, the price goes up. And so the dollar value of that circulating supply, even though it's less Bitcoin, it increases back up and then you dollar cost average in, right? And so will that dynamic continue? Like definitely. Um, and there are more people who are excited about buying Bitcoin today than there were yesterday. So I think I'm bullish on Bitcoin long term, um, but I just am not as bullish on it as I am Ethereum. Do you see the store of value thesis behind Bitcoin holding if Ethereum achieves, you know, its its goal of being, uh, you know, this foundation yeah. layer for the future Web 3.0? Right. I, I mean, I think long term, yeah. Um, I think it'll store value. I'm asking this because you know you have Ethereum, which is designed to be used for 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 stuff specifically de decentralized applications, and so by definition, if there's a lot of network activity on on Ethereum that and that continues to grow, like it too becomes a store of value just by definition. So I'm just curious how that. And and my my I just released a thread on this yesterday, and I, I kind of talked about how like uh, in the long run, price will Ethereum's price will will achieve a point where the issuance is equal to the fee burn because that's where it's where the market will trend towards is if there's there's net deflation price will keep going up and if there's net inflation it'll fall and so issuance will be equal to fee burn um, but the the consequence of that is that at that equilibrium point uh, you know circulating supply will remain fixed uh, and it won't be it won't be inflationary so it'll be a good store of value at, at that point right uh, short term that won't be the case and so it'll be a while before we get to that point. But it is interesting because, you know, when people talk about creating money, it's always, does it store value? Is it a unit of count? And is it a means of exchange? 
And then there's this extra criteria that critics will always put on there where they say, well, also, if you want to really use it as money, it can't be that volatile, right? Um, so I think in the short term, you know, neither neither Bitcoin nor Ethereum satisfy all of those criteria. They're all volatile. Uh, but in the long term, because Ethereum is building, you know, an economy, uh, it's going to be much more able to actually be money. Um, and eventually it'll store value just as well as Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, right, it just depends on why you're investing in it. Uh, I think People don't usually invest in like currencies to store their value um, because they use currencies. And so I think Ethereum is going to be really good at being money. People are going to use it. People are going to buy it to use it. Um, but I think if people are trying to buy something that stores value, like for at least the next like decade, I think Bitcoin is going to be the store of value play, quote unquote. Uh, and you're going to buy Ethereum to participate in building something big. Um, uh, what would you say is the next uh, killer app or let's say set of killer apps for Ethereum? Have you, have you thought through that? I mean, we have stable coins, DeFi, NFTs, uh, any thoughts on what might be next? Yeah, it's been wild because again, I'm pretty new to this space, but I think the cool thing about it is uh, a lot of this space is just emerging. And so I'm seeing, like, even as new as I am, I'm seeing so much change in, in the products that are offered, the amount that they're being used and the focuses of the ecosystem. Um, so when I started learning about Ethereum, I started learning about DeFi and that was the killer app. It was like the big thing that Ethereum brings to the world is decentralized financial services. Um, and there was some discussion of NFTs. And when I first published the report, I think maybe during it or briefly, after um, there was an NFT cycle where uh, I think I would say it was punctuated by the moment we all remember where Beeple famously sold his NFT for $60 million, something like that. Um, 65, I think. <laughs> right, and, and what's crazy is, so uh, just as part of my research process, I will scroll through crypto Twitter and just save articles and kind of keep them in a timeline on my desk just so I can kind of synthesize the noise. So. As this was happening, I was seeing this like rise. And then I was starting to save a lot of articles that chronicled the fall. There was a lot of articles showing how transaction volumes for NFTs were dropping. Uh, you know, the values of NFTs were dropping. The bubble was popping. I think you could make a really strong case that that first bubble popped. It went all the way down. And that what we're seeing today is another <laughs> bubble, another NFT bubble rise, which I guess, you know, again, like maybe I don't have enough experience. Maybe you've been through this kind of thing before, but I've never seen the same asset go through an entire rise and fall, the bubble pop, and then bubble up again in six months, like not even. Um, it's just been insane. Like if you bought a crypto punk six months ago, you saw the value of that punk rise, I don't even know, 10x, 100x, and then the bubble popped. And if you had tried to sell it, you would have sold, which you know, it's like art, so people were not selling it. But if you had tried to sell it, like there's a lot of evidence that you would have seen the value plummet 90 plus percent. And then today it's, you know, 10 times higher than it was at the peak before. Um, so NFTs are really interesting. I think it goes back to though, kind of, so when you see a fad come back, you have to ask like, is this the same thing coming back or is there something new here? And I think we are seeing really important differences this cycle. So before it was the rise, like it was the first time you could really buy these NFTs. So they're mostly just collectibles. I think a lot of the uh, criticism was, was, was fair and it was basically like, you can't do anything with this. You're, I think the meme is you're buying JPEGs, right? Um, yeah. Today, that's changing quite a bit. So now you're starting to be able to participate in communities. You're seeing social tokens emerge. You're starting to see gaming tokens, which I think people kind of knew was, was inevitably going to happen. Uh, where you bring NFTs in the world of gaming and you make um, things that people, the entire gaming economy already, it, the gaming economies already exist, right? They just, they never had scarcity of supply. When I went on to RuneScape and bought a sword, it wasn't like there's only 10 of the sword. So the economy never was meaningful, but gamers, uh, sorry, game developers have always been trying to monetize that and it's been difficult. NFTs change that entire industry. It gives digital scarcity to an economy that has always needed it and failed to have it. And so a lot of people criticize this by saying, well, this has already happened. We've seen this kind of story play out. Uh, the metaverse idea is, is old, not new. And I would say that it is, but there's a difference here, which is that we have new infrastructure that can actually do something different. 
which gets back to like use cases of the uh, ecosystem. We couldn't have digital scarcity before. It was always like you know, at best artificial scarcity enforced by the game developer who had an incentive to increase supply, but um, that's changing. And so this NFT bubble is showing off the capabilities of NFTs and you're seeing companies come into the space as well. So I guess, you know, publicly I can say I've seen, I've seen GameStop, I've seen Instagram, but I've also heard mutterings that I, I can't really mention about like companies in other areas that are saying NFTs are the future of our marketing. They're the future of our product releases um, because it's a way for them to monetize that they haven't had before. Um, and so when you see this amount of engagement from users and this amount of engagement from the companies themselves, I think that's just impossible to ignore. Uh, I'm almost at the point where I would say that it's going to be NFTs and the NFT ecosystem that drives adoption of DeFi rather than the other way around uh, because it's more culturally salient and it's more kind of uh, intuitive. Wait, what, is, what does that have to do with, what, or explain to me the overlap between NFTs and DeFi. What, yeah, I'm just so, do, so, do, so DeFi yeah, is yeah. building DeFi is building out the capability to do things with with crypto as money, and stable coins are kind of the, the base block of that, right? So you can you can lend them, you can uh, transfer them to people, you can use them as collateral, you can do all sorts of kind of interesting things. Um, but NFTs are going to take advantage of all of those same things, transferring things de between decentralized people. Uh, you're going to be able to fractionalize them. So you can take your one NFT, you can split it up into parts and you can send them to people. You can use them as collateral. I saw that was coming out. And again, people are going to be like, well, why do you need this? But the, the key is you can't come up with a useful use case until the capabilities are built out. So it's like, I can't explain to you why the internet's going to be interesting and awesome in a way that makes sense to you until like the computing technology that seems useless at the time is built out and then once it's built out and it's all there and you can do these useful things, um, then I can give you useful use cases. And so initially the killer app was DeFi. We're leveraging a lot of the infrastructure that was built for DeFi to build the NFT ecosystem. Uh, and then I think we're gonna see this reflexive kind of move backwards where these NFTs are being transacted with on the Ethereum blockchain. So if I buy an, an NFT that's a gaming NFT, uh, I can transact with it in game, but I can also sell it on the market for USDC, right? And I could I can lend it to someone for USDC. I can say I don't want to get paid in 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 game currency. I want to get paid in something that pays my bills. Um, and that's where when people talk about the metaverse, it gets really interesting because there is something new here where the worlds are overlapping, and crypto allows for that kind of interoperability in a decentralized way with scarcity that we just haven't had the technology to pull off before. Uh, and that's really exciting. Um, I think that's wild. Um, you know, one of the catalysts that's uh, coming up, I don't know when, is, is Facebook's introduction of DM. Has that hit your radar at all in terms of what that might mean for crypto um, or Ethereum or is a little it, bit. I've, I've heard yeah. mutterings about it, but I'm not well informed about the project. So I really can't comment. Yeah. Um, I, I think just another example, I think kind of bigger companies that are figuring out a way to enter the space and, and maybe drive legitimacy to um, crypto overall. Um, Nicole, this is incredible. I, I think we've covered a ton. Um, I don't want you to to, to fall asleep over there. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, is there any last words that you want to leave folks with um, uh, a crypto, a crypto gem, if you will, um, or just some, so just if there's one key takeaway here, yeah, theory, what would that be? I, I think the key takeaway is that um, when you're looking at a disruptive industry, uh, the, the key to whether you're right or wrong is that you're making a bet that the future will not look like the past. Okay, and I think a lot of people who are betting, even people who are bullish on Ethereum uh, are just betting that the future will look like the past because we've been fortunate enough that the past has been pretty kind. Um, and I, I think hopefully this discussion makes it quite clear that the future will look nothing like the past. And so if you're modeling your investment, you have to know that going in. Um, and if you're basing your arguments on what you've seen with kind of previous assets or previous uh, crypto assets in particular, you're going to be surprised, um, both in good ways and bad. Um, but I just think investors need to keep that in mind. It needs to be a part of everyone's analysis. If you're basing future Ethereum price action on past Bitcoin price action, that's just nonsense to me. Uh, and it needs you need to be taking into account 
you know, the expansion of NFT economies and the, you know, the shock to circulating supply in the future. Um, so yeah, I think that's the big thing. The future is going to be different than the past is the bet you're making. If you believe in that, make the bet. And if you don't, then stay out of it. Um, but that's, that's kind of, that's what I think people need to focus on. Duly noted, Nick Hill. Um, thanks again for taking the time. We'll be following up. Uh, you know, uh, it's going to be great to look at um, life post-merge. You'll be, you'll be my first call. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. This was fun. All righty. Take care. Take care.